Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and happy whatever day it is. Uh, welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, Larry Erickson, like I am every week doing this. And uh, for about the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at some things that might be interesting. Uh, and I also want to say now, welcome to 2015. And because this is the first show of the new year, going to be a little bit different. We're going to try to keep things a little bit upbeat, a little bit more on the happy side of things. I mean, there's a a lot of darkness out there and uh, a lot of darkness in my vision, but um, we're going to try to leave that aside for just this week, this, this one week. I'm going to start, I've mentioned this a couple of times, I'll probably keep mentioning it a few more, uh, which is that I noticed back in November during the uh, elections in this town here in Carver that uh, there were three candidates on the ballot from the Green Rainbow Party and that each of them got about 150 votes. So uh, the measers, you know, like 150 of us out here. And uh, I thought maybe we should get in touch with each other and get to know each other and, and maybe be able to, in some way, raise our voices to make it clear that there is actually a progressive voice here in Carver. So uh, if you're interested in that, be sure to email me, as you always can, if you have any reactions to the show, uh, at whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. That is my personal email, so um, please feel free to uh, contact me with any information, uh, and especially if you're interested in raising a progressive voice here. All right, uh, enough of that. We're going to start with some good news. We've got two bits of good news, and, you know, a lot of shows do, like, year-end wrap-ups, you know, they try to go back over everything from the previous year. and uh, So it's kind of fitting that our two bits of good news here for our first show of 2015 uh, are both about things that we have talked about a fair amount here in this past year. Uh, the first starts with the fact that a week before Christmas, the mayor and city council of Louisville, Kentucky, reached an agreement to raise the minimum wage in the city uh, to $9 an hour over the next couple of years and to tie the minimum wage to the consumer price index, that is the inflation rate, uh, for urban areas in the area, uh, in, the, in the vicinity beyond that point. Louisville thus joins places like uh, Seattle, San Francisco, Oakland, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. in raising the minimum wages in their cities. In doing so, they would overcome the opposition of businesses and business leaders who continue to claim that giving the lowest paid workers even a small increase will result in major job losses and economic doom and gloom. And they continue to claim that no matter how many times experiences has shown that that prediction just isn't true. Uh, for one example, when the small city of SeaTac, which is just south of Seattle, uh, when it raised its base pay in the city to $15 an hour in 2013, local businesses were up in arms. They were furious. But now, just one year later, the Puget Sound Business Journal reports that in the area, this wage increase now just gets a shrug. It's just not an issue. In fact, 2014 has been called by some the year of the minimum wage. And it was certainly at least the year in which all the work of the previous years really began to pay off. Besides the cities that have acted recently, 13 states, including some really deep red ones, passed minimum wage increases in 2014, with the direct result that one and a half million Americans got a pay raise as of January 1st. Another 1.4 million workers in New York State also got a raise because of legislation that stayed passed in 2013. And more than a million more are also going to see a raise because the minimum wage in their states is linked to the inflation rate. Altogether, at the start of this new year, 2015, nearly 4.5 million Americans got a raise as a direct result of the campaign to raise the minimum wage. As of January 1st, 29 states and the District of Columbia have minimum wages above the federal minimum. Now, the thing is, what's happened with this is especially important because these changes, these improvements came about as the, as the result, the direct result of an ongoing campaign 
uh, spearheaded, as we've noted here any number of times in the past, by low-wage workers, particularly in the fast food industry, uh, and their colleagues working for places like the notoriously anti-union Walmart, workers who have staged lightning strikes and public protest calling for a wage of $15 an hour. In other words, these improvements that have occurred have come as the result of worker power arousing a public conscience, generating a force strong enough that even the corporations could not overcome it, and the politicians, at least enough of them, dared not oppose it. That, it's good news. Uh, there's one final thought on this, one last thought. 21 states and the feds still apply the federal minimum wage, which is a puny $7.25 an hour. To give you an idea of just how low that is, if you're working at that wage full-time year-round, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, that gives you a yearly gross of $15,080, which is $650 below the federal poverty line for a family of two and nearly $9,000 below the poverty line for a family of four. Which also should indicate to you then that even with these increases, these new minimum wages simply are not enough. Just reaching poverty level for a family of four, again working full-time year-round, requires an hourly wage of at least $11.47 an hour, a level that most of these increases do not reach and will not reach even over the next few years. So if 2014 was the year of the minimum wage, maybe we can make 2015 the year of the living wage. And that would be really good news. Okay, our other bit of good news has to do with a topic that we have talked about a lot this year. Um, it's actually not a particular item, it's sort of an overview of the gains made in 2014 in the area of the right to same-sex marriage. Now you know, I expect frankly that you can't not know, uh, that the right to marry the person you love without regard to gender made major strides in 2014. Uh, that right is now endorsed or at least accepted by a majority of Americans. Uh, in many places, in fact, the idea of opposing same-sex marriage is coming to seem as anachronistic as the idea of opposing interracial marriage is. Even, uh, even President Hopi Changi himself has again evolved on the issue. He said in October that he believed that the um, Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, quoting him, does guarantee same-sex marriage in all 50 states. The thing is, though, despite knowing that, you may not realize just how much things have advanced. So here's a way to do it, okay? This map, this map here, shows uh, how the right to, marriage to right to marriage, right to marriage justice stood at the end of 2013. That is one year ago. The states in red were the states where same-sex marriage was allowed. The states in dark green had domestic partnerships of some sort. And uh, all the other states, all the ones that without color, all the white ones there, same-sex marriage was banned, although it was under, um, it was under court challenge in two states, Ohio and Utah. Okay? At the end of 2014, this is how it stands. Same-sex couples in 35 states now have the legal right to marry, and there are lower court rulings, which are still under appeal, but there are lower court rulings in favor of marriage justice in six more. Um, now, because of a division in uh, federal circuit court decisions on same-sex marriage, the, uh, the outlier is the Sixth Circuit, the one uh, that comprises the appropriately colored ugly yellow green states on that map. Uh, that's the outlier. But um, as a result of that division in circuit court uh, decisions, there's a good chance that the Supreme Court will take up the issue during its 2015 session. Now something that's significant here is that the number of states that allow same-sex marriage has reached an historic threshold. It's sort of been a tipping point where the court feels comfortable overturning the practices of the remaining states. 
Walter Dellinger, who was uh, an acting solicitor general during the Clinton administration, said, quoting him, when only a third of the states still retain a practice, the court seems ready to act. For example, when the court struck down bans on interracial marriage in, in the 1967 case Loving v. Virginia, such unions were still illegal in 16 states. When the court struck down anti-sodomy laws in 2003 in the case Lawrence v. Texas, 13 states still had such statutes on the books. Well, now, whenever the Supreme Court comes to consider same-sex marriage, uh, and at that point, same-sex marriage will be banned in no more than 15 states um, and perhaps even fewer. Of course, it's not that simple. It never is. Uh, in the Loving case, it was actually the result more of state legislatures uh, changing the law against interracial marriage than it was courts striking them down. Um, and of course, the final desperate argument of those who want to maintain marriage bigotry, um, a number in which I include the two to one majority, the, uh, the Sixth Circuit panel that upheld the bans on same sex marriage there. The final desperate argument of these people is that this should be left to the democratic process. And they point to the circumstances surrounding the Loving case as proof. The problem is, the problem is no matter how they try to glorify the democratic process, no matter how they try to deify a political and social consensus, the fact is that what these people are ultimately saying is that human rights are dependent upon the approval of the majority and the continuation of those rights is dependent upon that continuing approval. What they don't understand, or more likely, I think, refuse to understand in order to maintain their own bias, is that rights, especially the kind of written guarantees of rights, such as that are found in the Constitution, are not there to reflect the majority. They are there to protect the minority to protect the minority because the majority, by virtue of being the majority, does not need that protection. Enough people have realized this, or at least sense this thing about protecting the minority and minority rights, uh, and sense its application to this particular case, that the fact is that even in the face of this Supreme Court, the momentum on this matter seems to be on the side of those who favor marriage equality, who favor marriage justice. And that surely is good news. All right, trying to keep uh, our upbeat mood going here. We got good news. Well, now we're going to go to one of our occasional features. It's called the Hero Award. And it's given as the occasion arises to people who just do the right thing. Our hero in this case is a man named Thomas. We don't know his last name. Uh, in fact, uh, I can't even show you a picture of him because where he appears is in a video uh, done by a YouTube prankster named Josh Paler Lynn. Now, there are a bunch of videos on YouTube showing pranks of various sorts. Some of them are silly. Uh, some of them aren't. Some of them are mean. This one had the potential to be mean. In the video, Lynn gives $100 to a homeless man who can be heard on the video saying that uh, his name is Thomas. Lynn then secretly follows Thomas to see how he's going to spend the money. When Thomas goes into a liquor store, Lynn initially thinks he's got his answer. But he keeps on filming and discovers that contrary to what he expected, contrary to what he thought, what Thomas had purchased in the liquor store was food. And he went to a local park and he gave out that food to the homeless people there. Now, in fact, if you explore YouTube some, you can find multiple videos showing this, multiple videos proving the facts so well established that we should regard it as a truism that the poor who have so little are more generous, far more generous, far kinder, far more willing to share than the rich who have more than they could ever possibly use. So Thomas, you are by no means the only one, but you are a symbol of the rest, and you are a hero. And we're taking a break.
Okay, and we're back. And we're going to take the rest of the show, in a way, talking about um, the year uh, and the year of the past and the year to come. Um, first off, actually, we're going to have uh, one of our, uh, another one of our occasional features. This one's called And Another Thing. Uh, this is where we move away from politics for a time to something. Usually it's some cool science stuff, but this week it's some cool history stuff. Because last show, I talked about the question of why Christmas is on December 25th as opposed to any other day of the year. So this week we're doing the natural follow-up, which is why is New Year's Day on January 1st as opposed to any other day of the year? I mean, it wasn't always, so why is it January 1st? Well, the short answer is that in large part it has to do with the administrative convenience of the Roman Senate, a calendar almost no one uses anymore, and the stubbornness of tradition. Now, the earliest recorded celebrations of the New Year are believed to have taken place in Mesopotamia about 4,000 years ago, but about 2,000 BCE, when the Babylonians began the new year uh, at the first new moon after the vernal equinox. The vernal equinox, again, is the first day of spring. Uh, they greeted this with a multi-day celebration called Akitu. Now, this actually is, is a fairly logical time to start the year. The vernal equinox, again, the first day of spring. Uh, it's a time of renewal. It's a time of beginnings. It's a time when you're going to be thinking about planting and so on. So it's, it's a reasonable time to start the new year. Now, other ancient cultures, there are several other ancient cultures that used uh, various days for the new year, but it seemed to have, for the most part, some kind of astronomical or astrological significance. Uh, the Egyptians used the helical rising of the star Sirius, which occurs in mid-July, because that predicted the imminent time of the flooding of the Nile, which is so vital for their agriculture. Uh, the Persians used the vernal equinox, first day of spring. The Phoenicians used the autumnal equinox, which is the first day of fall. And the Greeks used the winter solstice, the first day of winter, in each case to mark the start of the new year. Well, January 1st has no such significance. It's not astronomically or astrologically significant. So why January 1st? Now, the thing is, the early Roman calendar designated March 1st as the first day of the year. Um, which, by the way, may also or does serve to explain something which you may have wondered about. If March is the first month of the year, uh, September then is the seventh month of the year, and the Latin for seven is septum. October, the eighth month, octo is eight in Latin, novum is, the, is nine in Latin, and decum is ten in Latin. So September, October, November, December were named that because they were the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th months of the year. Now, according to a general, apparently not universal, but general agreement among historians, it was in 153 BCE when the Roman Senate moved the first day of the year from March 1st to January 1st. Now, the reason they did this is because January 1st marked the start of the civil year, the government year. Um, January 1st was the day that newly elected members of the Roman Senate took their seats. So for the administrative convenience of the Senate, everything New Year is now January 1st. Uh, it was also a reasonable time, again, to start the year, January, because January was named for Janus, the, the Roman god of gates, doors, and beginnings. Sort of like the god of that moment of change. In fact, Janus, the god Janus, had two faces so that he could see both the past and the future simultaneously. Now, the Roman calendar at use at the time, though, was a lunar one with 10 months and a 304-day year because it's based on the lunar months, the cycles of the moon, and the cycles of the moon do not actually exactly match up with the solar year that drives things like the seasons and the solstices and the equinoxes. So the two are out of whack. And by the time of Julius Caesar, uh, the lunar calendar, the Roman lunar, lunar calendar was seriously off from the year. So in 46 BCE, Julius Caesar introduced a new solar-based calendar. It's called the Julian calendar, appropriately enough. And this calendar, he decreed, 
officially that the start of the new year was January 1st. But the thing is that after the Roman Empire fell and Christianity is spreading across Europe, there was a desire by the Catholic Church to downplay the pagan, unchristian festivals uh, that had grown up around the celebration of the new year in January, uh, celebrations in Rome that had uh, sprung up around that time. So in 567, the Council of Tours banned using January 1st as the first day of the year. And this, of course, was a period of time in Europe where it basically said, if the church said it, that's the law. So in the Middle Ages in Europe, the official start of the new year, the official start of the new year, occurred in different places at different times. Uh, some places actually was December 25th, which by then was well established as the traditional day to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Uh, some went back to the old day of March 1st. Some used March 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation, and in uh, fact, right around the time of the vernal equinox. Some even used Easter, even though that comes on a different day every year. But by the time the Council acted in 567, the practice of keeping January 1st as New Year's Day was so well established that even though the official start of the new year was some other day, most people still use January 1st. Now the Julian calendar was also flawed. Uh, by the latter 1500s, the calendar was again seriously out of whack with the solar year. So in 1582, Pope Gregory XIII oversaw the design of a new, more accurate calendar. This one introduced the use of leap years in order to keep the calendar from getting too far out of whack with the solar year. Uh, this is the Gregorian calendar, which, which uh, is pretty much the same as we use one now. There has been a tweak in it, which is that uh, it was discovered that the Gregorian calendar actually slightly overcorrects. Uh, which is fixed by having century years, years that end in two zeros, uh, that they're only leap years if they're divisible by 400, not by four. So 2000 was a leap year, but 1900 was not, and 2100 will not be. Uh, one other thing Pope Gregory did, he gave in, surrendered to tradition, and again made January 1st the first day of the year. Uh, now, Catholic countries in Europe were quick to adopt this, but uh, Protestant ones only did it slowly because uh, they were suspicious that the Antichrist in Rome, that is the Pope, was trying to trick them into worshiping on the wrong days. Uh, for example, Scotland didn't adopt this calendar until 1600, 18 years later. And England, which had used March 25th as the first day of the year since sometime in the 1100s, didn't finally make the change, which means the colonies here also didn't actually make this change, until 1752, 180 years after the introduction of the Gregorian calendar. In order to make the adjustment and to bring the Julian calendar in line with the Gregorian calendar, they're now by now 11 days off. Sometime in September of 1752, the, the government of England just said, well, all right, it was like if it was, if it was September 13th, they said that there's September 13th, the next day is September 24th. It just dropped 11 days from the calendar. A, uh, riots broke out. People were saying, You've stolen 11 days of my life. Who's going to pay me for the 11 days of labor that I've lost? Uh, my life is going to be 11 days shorter. All of that is an interesting story in its own right, but uh, I'm going to have to leave that aside for now. The point is that's it. January 1st is the first date of the year, not due to any special significance or relevance of the date itself, but due to the administrative convenience of the Roman Senate the Julian calendar, which almost nobody uses anymore, and the surrender of Pope Gregory XIII to the power of tradition. Now I'm gonna wrap up with just, uh, just some thoughts about something, about the show, about coming into 2015. I've been doing the show, it's getting close to four years now. And my one wish for this show, my one hope for this show, my intent from the start, is that it would be useful. That's always been my intent as a political activist from the very beginning was to be useful.
I once in the, it was in the late 70s, it was, I had an idea of mine that I bandied about a bit. Uh, it basically got stolen by a member of Congress who advanced it as his own program, and somebody asked me if I was angry about that, and I said, eh, you know, a little bit. Recognition is always nice, but I wasn't really upset because to me the important thing was not who got the credit, it's whether or not it got done. See, what I'm doing here, what this whole show is about, is what's known as advocacy journalism. It's where we deal in facts, facts, sources, uh, statements, studies, but try to present those facts in a moral and ethical context. So our target audience here is, is in fact, those who, in a, at least in a broad and general way, agree with the point of view that I'm presenting. I know there's been a couple of people who told me they watch this show even though they don't agree with it because they think it's well done, they enjoy it. Uh, a couple of others who say that they check it out from time to time because they want to see what the liberals are saying. But, and I, you know, I appreciate those people, but it's not really the target because the purpose of this show, the goal of this show, is to rouse and inspire, to provide background and analysis that puts facts in a moral and ethical context and so spurs action. So this is what I want. I would like any of you who have felt moved to do anything because of this show, make a phone call, write a letter, make a donation, even just talk about this to, to a neighbor or a family member or somebody. Um, if you have felt moved to do anything by anything I've talked about here, drop me a line. Whovieating at AOL.com, drop me a line, let me know. Let me know. I mean, let's put it this way. I, I mean, I like recognition. Okay, I've got a big enough ego. I like recognition. You know, I like when, when, you know, when somebody says, you know, aren't you the guy on the TV? Yeah, I like that, all right? But what's important and what I want to do is, again, to be useful, to be of use, to use the skills that I have, meager that they may be, to advance the causes I believe in. So if I've helped you do that, let me know. Um, and by the way, for those of you who find my style overly blunt, a Chinese proverb, an actual one, says, calling things by their right names is the beginning of wisdom. So what I wish for you, for all of us, is the most joyous and peaceful new year possible. And for the moment, you have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. Peace.